Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today I'm here to attempt to wrap up all of the books that I read in June. Now June was an odd month just between how busy I was and going on vacation. The number of books that I read was definitely a lot lower than they have been the past few months. But on top of that I feel like a lot of the books that I read were just pretty forgettable or I just didn't really have a lot of feelings or thoughts about them. So I'm not entirely sure what I'm gonna say about them in this wrap-up but we're gonna see. Hopefully this means that this wrap-up is going to actually be a reasonable length. Famous last word. So let's go ahead and just hop right in. So the very first book that I read in the month of June was The X Talk by Rachel Lynn Solomon. I selected this book for June because I had Rachel Lynn Solomon on a list of authors that I wanted to read in 2023 to determine whether or not I wanted to keep her on my radar. And The X Talk follows her main character Shay Goldstein and public radio is essentially her life. She has worked at Seattle Public Radio for about 10 years since she was in college. She's extremely good at her job. She's like the youngest producer that they've ever had and she really loves what she does. And then one day they hire Dominic Yoon who's a few few years younger than Shay. He's never really worked in public radio but he has a graduate degree in the field and so he kind of thinks he knows everything. He walks around the station, thinks he's God's gift to public radio, thinks he knows absolutely everything about it which of course completely grates on Shay's nerves. And this is definitely a really small public radio station. They are kind of floundering and they need some new ideas to get in listenership. And one day Shay kind of pushes the idea of a show called The X Talk where two exes host basically a relationship advice show. And her station manager absolutely loves this idea but instead of having having two exes host the show. He actually wants Shay and Dominic to host the show because there's already like a palpable tension between the two, kind of similar to what you would expect between exes. He already knows that the two don't like each other and he feels like they would be the perfect people to host the show, even though they've never actually dated. But in order to host the show, Shay and Dominic would have to basically pretend like they have dated. They don't really love the idea of lying to the public. They very much believe in honesty and transparency and journalism, but it's either that or lose their jobs. So they go ahead and they go forward with it and the X Talk is almost instantly a major success. So many people love it. They get really popular really quickly and because of that Shay and Dominic kind of have to deepen their treachery. They have to kind of start getting to know each other on a deeper level if they are going to pull off this charade that they are holding. So essentially you can kind of see where it goes. As they start to get to know each other they start to fall for each other for real and then of course there's conflict that comes in. They have to overcome it and then they have to get together. Happy endings all around. So this is one that I'm honestly a little bit meh about. I rated it a 3.5 on Goodreads and I can't honestly tell you why I feel like it was a 3.5 stars. I thought it was pretty well written. I was enjoying myself while I was reading it but it didn't have the extra oomph that I was expecting in the story. That's kind of like what I want to see in my romances. I like some harder hitting elements in there. I really want the author to pull at your heartstrings and make you root for the characters and root for their relationship and I didn't feel like I got that in this story. So this is one of those stories where there really isn't anything glaringly wrong with it but it's not something that 100% worked for me and even now I'm still having kind of a hard time remembering what it was actually about, what all the details of the story were, the conflict that happened, and things like that. So overall I enjoyed my reading experience of it while I was in the moment but it's not something that made a lasting impression. Again it was okay, it was cute, but I'm not really gonna proceed with her as an author. Oh also really quickly I forgot to mention that the X Talk did also satisfy a TBR game prompt of reading a book with spring vibes. Then to satisfy the prompt of reading a book with fall vibes I ended up picking up The Haunting of Ashburn House by Darcy Coates. I had been hearing a lot about Darcy Coates from Sid Book Warm's Patreon and this is the one that kind of got the most hype so this is the one that I ended up picking up and in this story you're following our main character Adrian, and she's definitely down on her luck. She really doesn't have a place to stay. She doesn't have a lot of friends. She has no family. It's just her and her cat Wolfgang and then one day she is told that she has inherited Ashburn House from a great aunt that she never knew existed. She never met this aunt. She had no idea she had any family left. Then all of a sudden Ashburn House which is definitely a notorious house in its location. A lot of people spread rumors about Adrian's aunt Edith who lived there prior that she was kind of crazy, that there were ghosts, that this place was haunted. And so Ashburn House definitely has a reputation, but Adrian is desperate. She needs a place to stay. And so she and her cat go ahead and move into Ashburn House. And then of course, the more that she's there, the more she starts to notice things. There are strange messages etched into the walls. Furniture is moving when she leaves the room. And then Adrian comes across a grave in the middle of the woods that starts to reveal some very unpleasant secrets. And it kind of goes from there. I, for the most part, enjoyed my reading experience overall. I remember for the first half of this story or so, I wasn't necessarily necessarily invested in it. I was just kind of along for the ride but then we start to get into the really spooky stuff and I love the atmosphere. I love the vibe. I love the direction that the story ultimately takes. Now naturally this is a supernatural story so you're going to kind of have to suspend your disbelief but overall I still really enjoy the direction that Darcy Coates took with the story. I would absolutely be willing to read more from her in the future. In fact she has a new story coming out in July that is supposed to be a wintry isolation thriller. I don't think that's supposed to be supernatural in any way but I'm here for it because I kind of want to see what she can do in that 
genre just based on this. So if you really like haunted house horror type of stories, I highly recommend checking this out because ultimately I really did end up liking the direction that it took and the plot line and the storyline between Adrian's aunt and the grave in the woods and all of that stuff. I liked how it kind of all tied together. So this ended up being a four star for me and I'm glad that I read it. Okay, so speaking about books that I really remember nothing about, even though it's only been a couple of weeks since I finished it, The Last Party by Claire McIntosh. This was not originally on my June TBR. I picked this up because for Slayer Fest, one of the prompts was to start a series and I didn't really have the availability to go ahead and start another chunky fantasy series. And so I picked this up because this is technically the first in her Detective Theon Morgan series. And I honestly remember almost nothing about this. What I do remember is that this is following a murder investigation into the death of Reese Lloyd, who was brutally murdered on the night of his own New Year's Eve party. And Theon Morgan is one of the detectives that is investigating the crime. Now this is happening in a very small town. It's happening in Wales, I believe. And Theon was born and raised there. She knows absolutely everybody. So this is somewhat personal to her in that a lot of the people that she's investigating, she knows personally. And so she's kind of having to set that aside during this murder investigation. But basically the one thing everybody all has in common is that they all wanted Reese Lloyd dead. So everybody has a really strong motive for murder. So this is the story following her investigation into the death of Reese Lloyd. Now this was essentially your run of the mill standard detective fiction plot. And that is something that I'm very much moving away from because you're definitely not getting the well-developed characters. It's not a character driven story. It is 100% plot driven. And in a story like this, where the cast of characters is so wide, I don't even feel like you can really get to know them even on a superficial level. And so that's what really aggravates me these days about detective fiction. It was certainly no different in this. And another thing that kind of aggravated me about this story is that for the most part, it's kind of told from Theon's perspective entirely, but the past perspectives are told told in brief snippets from each of these individual characters and they're not even in a linear time frame. Like some will snap back to New Year's Day and then Christmas and then a couple weeks before Christmas and then sometimes before that. And so you're getting all of these random character perspectives not in a linear order. You're kind of having to keep it all straight while you're reading this and I don't really feel like it added too terribly much to the story overall. I feel like all of the stuff that were revealed in those snippets were things that could have been uncovered like in interviews that Theon Morgan was having with these characters or even in conversations that these characters were having with one another. So so I don't feel like those past perspectives were really doing a whole heckin' ton. And like I said, there were just so many characters in here. They all wanted Reese dead. They all had a motive for murder. They're all suspects. None really stuck out more than the other, which I can kind of applaud Claire McIntosh for because it wasn't like she was trying to throw a lot of red herrings your way or she wasn't trying to focus on one specific person. So you kept your eyes on that person. Every single character in here could have potentially been Reese Lloyd's murderer, but I'm not connected to absolutely any of them. I'm not emotionally invested in the story. I don't care who lives or dies. And I really didn't care who ended up committing the crime. I will say that I did like some of the little twists that Claire McIntosh threw in here because just when you are getting to the end and you think that you know who did it and why, something else is tossed in there and I thought that added a little bit something to the story. But in the end, I'm sad to say that this was just a forgettable book. It just didn't really hold my attention. It didn't grab me. I was kind of bored throughout some of it. I didn't really get interested in it until like the latter half of the book. So ultimately this just didn't work for me. I rated it a three stars and I won't be continuing in the series. The next book that I read in June was 13 by Steve Cabot. And all, this was the next book in his Eddie Flynn series. If you're not familiar, this follows our main character, Eddie Flynn, who is a con artist turned defense attorney. He used to be a con artist and he decided to kind of clean himself up. And now he uses the skills that he learned as a con artist to be the best defense attorney that he could possibly be. And he basically has one rule in that he has to know this client is innocent. He will not intentionally represent somebody who he knows to be guilty. So he is actually quite an honest defense attorney. And these books are usually very fast paced. They typically take place over just a couple of days and usually Eddie Flynn has found himself into a very tight high stakes kind of spot and this one was a little bit different in the fact that you're getting two perspectives you're not just getting Eddie Flynn's you're getting Eddie Flynn's and you're getting another character and the character is actually the villain of the story because the villain is a serial killer and the serial killer is actually on the jury of the trial that Eddie Flynn is a part of he is defending a client who is being accused of murder but the person who's actually guilty of that murder is sitting on the jury and he has killed multiple times before again this was very fast paced very high stakes it keeps the pages turning it is completely impulsively readable, but most importantly, it is smart and insanely clever. Now, typically fast paced stories are not my thing because like I said, I really like the slow burn, well-developed character driven stories. I really need to be emotionally connected to the stories that I'm reading. And I like to have that harder hitting gut punch. That's what really makes a story five stars for me. And I'm not gonna ever get that from a story like Eddie Flynn's, right? But they're such a good time and they're so insanely well-crafted that I definitely wanna just keep coming back to them. I've always really enjoyed legal thrillers because I really think that the back and forth between the defense and the prosecution 
fiction is an art form. I feel like Steve Cavanaugh is able to put that on the page and bring it to life so fantastically. And like I said, they're just so smart, so well crafted, so clever. And I certainly think that they are worth the read. And I gave this one a four stars and I will certainly be continuing in the series. Another just okay romance that I read in the month of June, Hook, Line, and Sinker by Tessa Bailey. I picked this up because first of all, I needed to go ahead and finish this duology, but also I used it to satisfy the prompt of reading a book with summer vibes from my TBR game. If you're not familiar, this is the Bellinger Sisters duology and it follows two sisters, Piper and Hannah. You meet both of them in the very first book, but the very first book is primarily following Piper and her story as she's kind of being forced to move from LA to the small fishing town in Washington, which is where her biological father was from. She's kind of been getting in trouble in LA and her stepfather is sick of it and he's really not going to take any more of her crap and he wants her to learn some responsibility. And so he sends her to this town to kind of get to know her roots, to kind of be humbled a little bit. And you're following her as she meets Brendan, a fisherman in the town, and it's kind of their love story. And in this story, we're following Hannah. She is still living in LA and she still kind of has this crush on Sergey, who is like a producer or director of movies that Hannah works on. And they are about to start filming a movie and Hannah kind of proposes the idea of moving the filming location from LA to the small town in Washington because she feels it fits the vibe. And so they all kind of pick up, move from LA and go to the small Washington town. And Hannah is going to be staying with Fox while she is there. Now, Fox is the best friend of Brendan. They both work together on a fishing boat and Hannah and Fox have developed a friendship over the past several months since they met in the first book. They are texting constantly and what Hannah doesn't know is that Fox has really fallen for her, which is really unusual for Fox because Fox has a terrible reputation in the town of being a player. He is known as a ladies man, a good time, and basically nothing else. Hannah is constantly warned against Fox, saying that he's going to do nothing but break her heart. And so it shouldn't really be a big deal that she is living with Fox because like I said, she has feelings for this other guy. Fox is a player who couldn't possibly have feelings for her. And you can kind of see where this is going. So this is another example kind of in line with the X talk where I wasn't really getting the gut punch that I was looking for. Now I do admit that Tessa Bailey does cover a topic in here that you don't normally see and that is the aspect of slut shaming when it comes to guys. Now like I said Fox has this very well-known reputation of being a ladies man. He is a good time. Nobody in the town thinks that he is capable of being a relationship and that is kind of also a hangover from his father who was exactly the same way. And so Fox kind of grew up always thinking that he was going to be exactly like his father because that is what his mother and the whole town kind of put on him and so that's what he has become. But over the past several months since he's met Hannah and he started developing feelings and a friendship with her, he really hasn't been with anybody, but he's kind of kept that on the down low. He doesn't want anybody to know. And he also doesn't want Hannah to kind of be caught up with him because he knows that by association, there is going to be some things said about her. And you're kind of following how that reputation mentally and emotionally traumatizes Fox and what he's kind of trying to do to overcome it and how Hannah helps him do that. And she is not willing to let Fox push her away. Like once it becomes obvious that there are feelings there and that they could be something more than friends, Hannah is not willing to let Fox push them away and put his baggage on their relationship, which I thought was really refreshing. So she kind of gets over her crush on Sergei. She realizes that Fox is right in front of her and that she wants him. She wants to be with him. And it goes from there. It is the development of their relationship. And then in terms of Hannah, you know, Hannah is trying to be the leading lady in her own life. She's always really taken the supportive role and she likes it that way. She likes being supportive of people, but it's kind of prevented her from getting what she wants. And so you're following her as she's trying to be brave and kind of forge her own path. And you just kind of see them come together and they accept each other for who they are and all of their flaws. Overall, it was just a really sweet, cute, fun time. It didn't do a whole heck of a lot for me. This is not a romance that I'm going to remember in a couple of weeks. I don't even remember a lot of it now. And so I only gave this one a three stars, unfortunately. Next, I picked up Faithless by Karen Slaughter. This is the fifth book in her Grant County series. This was a challenge prompt that I pulled for myself, as was 13 by Steve Cavanaugh. I needed to read the next book in the Eddie Flynn series as part of a challenge prompt. This was another one and I definitely got to this. If you're not familiar, this is set in small Grant County in Georgia and it follows our main character, Sarah Litton. The county is so small that Sarah Litton is not only the town's pediatrician, she is also the medical examiner. And this series follows her as she works to help solve crimes with Jeffrey Tolliver, who happens to be her former husband, now ex-husband slash current fiance. Yes, it's a little bit complicated. In this particular story, Sarah and Jeff are kind of out arguing in the woods behind Sarah's parents house and Jeffrey is kind of chasing after Sarah when he trips over what looks like a pipe in the ground and they kind of instantly know what that means. They both start digging furiously and they end up finding a coffin with the dead girl inside, a recently dead girl who was probably alive just a few hours ago. And so this leads them of course on a major investigation and there's actually kind of a cult-like aspect to some of the characters in here which was really fascinating. I really enjoyed this one. It's not as strong to me as books three and four in the series but certainly stronger than books one and two. But I did still really enjoy this one. While I wouldn't necessarily say you need to read them in order, I would definitely recommend so that you could see the progression, not just between Jeffrey and Sarah, but Lena, who is Jeffrey's detective in this. And my gosh, she's probably one of the, the most frustrating characters I've ever read. I absolutely hate her. I never like her in any of these stories, but she definitely has her 
own stuff that she is going through and so that progresses from book one all the way into probably the end of the series which is book six. So I'm almost done with this series. I'm very glad that I'm making progress with it and then I think once I finish this I will dive into the Will Trent series by Karen Slaughter. So this was a good solid time. I gave it four stars. Next I'm happy to report that I did end up finishing House of Sky and Breath by Sarah J Mass in June. I ended up buddy reading this with Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand. I had a great time buddy reading it with her and of course you could see I tabbed it up a bit. This is the second book in her Crescent City series. I believe there's going to be three or four books in the series. The next one coming out in January and I cannot wait. I'm not going to say too terribly much about this obviously because it is a sequel and I definitely want to avoid spoilers. This I would say is certainly not as strong as House of Earth and Blood. I absolutely love that one. I thought it was a strong adult fantasy debut. I absolutely loved getting to know all of the characters and you certainly see more in here. A lot more page time especially for some of the smaller characters that you met in the first book. There were a lot of things that happened in here. A lot of things that were revealed. A lot of twists and turns and the ending. If you know you know. If you read this book I bet your mind was just as blown as mine was. I had no idea what to think when I got to the ending. It certainly sends this series in definitely a much different direction than what I was expecting and I'm not entirely sure how to feel about it but it certainly makes me anxious for the next one that is coming out. I will say that the ending of this book definitely did make me want to finish the other Sarah J Mass series that I haven't finished with but that's all I'm gonna say about it. This was a solid four stars for me whereas House of Earth and Blood was five stars. This was a four star so I don't necessarily think it suffered from second book syndrome because I think it was still a strong story on its own. It just wasn't as good as House of Earth and Blood. Next I ended up picking up Yours Truly by Abby Jimenez. So this is the companion to Part of Your World because this book follows Brianna Ortiz who is the best friend of Alexis, the main character of Part of Your World. And at the start of the story her life is not going well. She caught her husband cheating and so now they are in the process of finalizing their divorce. And this has definitely traumatized Brie in terms of she feels like she's never going to be able to trust a man again. She says that she's never going to get married. She says she's never can go into a relationship blind again. She's always going to have her eyes wide open and she's not sure that she could ever love somebody else. Because of this she is also now living in her childhood home which is basically so dated kind of an ode to the 70s which she's very embarrassed about. And on top of that her younger brother Benny is currently in renal failure and he is going to die if he doesn't get a kidney donation. So there is a lot going on with Brianna and on top of that she thinks that she is a shoe-in to kind of be the chief medical doctor in the ER but then a new guy Dr. Jacob Maddox transfers in and suddenly he becomes her competition. And so naturally she abhors Jacob Maddox and she just finds him infuriating. They've had a couple of interactions they haven't really gone well so Jacob Maddox is definitely on her shit list. But then you're meeting Jacob Maddox and he personally is going through his own stuff. In fact the reason why he transferred to Brianna's hospital is because the hospital that he was working at was where his brother and ex-girlfriend who is currently his brother's fiance now works and he kind of had to disentangle himself from that whole situation. So he transferred to Brianna's hospital and yes like I said they've had some really awkward interactions but Jacob actually has pretty serious social anxiety and that can cause him to make bad situations worse so like maybe he doesn't say the right thing or he says things that come off in a way that he doesn't mean. And he realizes that he kind of got off on the wrong foot with Brianna and so in order to make up for it he actually writes her a letter because he feels like he can communicate better and process his thoughts better in writing. So he leaves her a letter and it's a lovely letter and it kind of instantly charms Brianna and she writes him back and it begins this back and forth letter writing between them where they really get to know each other and they start to develop this friendship. And when Jacob finds out that he is a match for Benny he decides that he is going to donate a kidney to Benny. It is something that he's always wanted to do because a donor actually saved his mother's life and so he wants to kind of pay that forward and so he decides to give Benny a kidney and when Brianna finds that out and when she also finds out that Jacob is kind of in a sticky spot with his family because he has told his family that he has a girlfriend because he wants his family to truly understand that he is okay with the situation with his brother and his ex-girlfriend. He's not harboring any resentment. He is okay if they get married. He doesn't need his family to hate his brother and hate his fiance. He just kind of wants everybody to move on and he doesn't think that they're going to be able to do that unless they believe that he personally has moved on with somebody else. So he tells everybody that he has a girlfriend and when Brianna finds this out she actually offers to be Jacob's girlfriend and so there is definitely a fake dating aspect to this and so naturally you can kind of see where this goes as they are fake dating and Brianna is getting to know Jacob and getting to know his family. She definitely starts to fall for him although she's very trepidatious about it because like I said she's traumatized. She doesn't really feel like she can trust men anymore even though Jacob is like the perfect male specimen. He is a cinnamon roll. He is a give the shirt off his back type of guy but you are watching just the sweet development of their relationship. Now I will say I went into this book a little bit hesitant because a lot of people who absolutely loved Part of Your World and still really enjoyed this said that there was miscommunication in here and that halted me because miscommunication is one of my least favorite tropes and romances. And after reading this I can see where the miscommunication comes in because both of the characters are under the assumption that neither one of them wants something more. They're both giving each other these mixed signals and they're not obviously expressing themselves very well. So that's where the miscommunication comes in. But it didn't really bother me so 
so much in this book. And the reason I say that is because this miscommunication wasn't necessarily used to further the plot. This plot would have still happened with or without that miscommunication because the fake dating would have still happened and the kidney transplant would have still happened. The miscommunication just kind of added another level of angst and drama. I will say that Abby Jimenez did add a little bit something that I hate. It's another one of my least favorite romance tropes. I'm not going to say what it is because spoilers, but it was near enough to the end where they're starting to come up to this resolution where they do know that they want to be together. And so it didn't bother me as much as it could have. Like if that had been a major part of the story, that would have been like a deal breaker for me. And it probably would have instantly taken this from a high four to a low three in all honesty. But I did rate this a four stars. I really enjoyed my time with it. I really enjoyed watching the development of the relationship between Brianna and Jacob. I mentioned this in my mid-year book freakout tag, but I just love the way that Abby Jimenez writes male love interests. So I really did still enjoy this love story and I gave it a four stars. The final book that I read in the month of June, The Only Survivors by Megan Miranda. So this follows a group of people who, while they were in high school, they were the only survivors of this devastating crash that took the lives of two teachers and several fellow classmates. And every single year they get together in this kind of Airbnb rental in the Outer Banks of North Carolina to not necessarily remember and commemorate the accident, but also as kind of a pact that they made with each other to never reveal what actually happened that night. So right off the bat, you know that there is something more that happened in the past than what everybody else believes to be. And so in the present day, you're following our main character, Cassidy, who obviously is one of the only survivors as she's going to this rental in the Outer Banks to meet up with her classmates. She swore that she was never going to do it again. In fact, she got a new phone. She deleted everybody's contacts. But when she finds out that one of them actually passed away recently, she feels obligated to go and meet with everybody else. So you're following her as she's going there. You're meeting all of the other characters. And then in between that, and something that I kind of found the most obnoxious about this story is you are definitely flashing back to the past. But Megan Miranda brings back a literary device that she used with all the missing girls. And she's trying to tell the story backwards. But instead of having a fully fleshed out narrative that's going from the end of the accident to right before the accident. What you're getting are brief snippets from each character and each character is a different hour. So one character will be hour seven, one character will be hour six and so on until you get to the very final hour. So it was very clunky and choppy in my opinion. I don't feel like that added anything to the story overall. It was just hard to keep track of. This is another instance where there are so many characters that you are trying to keep track of that you can never fully know or connect with any of them. You are definitely not emotionally invested in the story or of the characters. They're all kind of unlikable in one way or another, but you don't really know that because you can't really get to know any of these characters. And so the way that she was trying to tell this past perspective was just kind of her way of being extremely clever, but didn't necessarily work. But you do know that something else happened on that night outside of the accident, and all of these people have vowed to kind of cover it up. And you also don't necessarily know what caused the accident in the first place. So that's kind of a secret that's not revealed until the very end either. And kind of on top of that, I really just don't feel like there was a lot happening throughout this story. We are just following all these classmates as they are meeting up at this beach house and Cassidy has a foreboding feeling that something is going to happen. And she starts to notice these sinister things happening like she swears that somebody is out on the beach that somebody is watching them. She finds a phone that was washed up and it ends up being a phone number that texted her right before she ended up deciding to go to the beach house. So something more is definitely happening here. And then one of the survivors who was at the beach house originally kind of left and never came back and they don't know what happened to her. So you definitely know that something else is going on but you're not entirely sure what. And of course, it is all revealed over the course of the story. Ultimately, though, I just didn't think that this worked the way that Megan Miranda wanted to. Like I said, there was very little going on for the majority of the story until you're getting to the end and you're getting to the final hours of the past perspective and you actually fully understand what happened to the accident, who did what and why the accident happened, what was going on at the beach, who was actually stalking them and doing all of these things. So you get the answers that you're looking for. And some of them were pretty interesting. Like I said, Megan Miranda does typically give me an ending that I can at least be partially satisfied with. But the journey is not always worth it. And so I think in the end, I've ultimately decided that I need to go ahead and break up with Megan Miranda. She has always been hit or miss for me. I've never outright loved any of her stories. And I think that this is just proof that I no longer need to waste any more time with her. There are so many other thriller suspense authors that are so much stronger that I have such a deep love for and I just don't need to read any more Megan Miranda. So I think I gave this a 3.5 stars on Goodreads. I think it's probably closer to a three stars if I'm being honest with you. I think I was just being really, really generous after I had finished it, but it didn't ultimately work for me. So it is what it is. I'm not going to read any more Megan Miranda in the future, I don't believe. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the books that I read in the month of June. With the exception of yours truly in House of Sky and Breath, I really don't feel like I outwardly loved any of the books that I read. Some were strong reading experiences, but yet a lot of them were just not very memorable and I didn't really have a lot of thoughts or feelings on most of them as well. So it's just kind of a bleh type of reading month and I'm hoping that July is a lot better. I've got to go. I'm hosting sprints in just a few minutes, so I'm going to wrap this up. Please comment down below and let me know some of the best and worst books that you've read in June or if you've read any of the books 
books that I read and what your thoughts were. Or if you made it at the end, maybe just leave me a little letter emoji in honor of yours truly. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week, sometimes two, depending on what I could do. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys. Thank you.